Today on Excellent Living, relationship expert Johnny Parker. Our greatest need, Cheryl, is for relationship and community. And I believe God allows the pressure in order for the pressure to drive us to community where women with women can be honest about their raging hormones, feeling sexually starved. And they can talk honestly about that. And the same for men, where men can talk honestly about what's going on in terms of their sexuality and talk about that and the battles and the temptations. Our greatest need is not sexual. Our greatest need, as God says, it's not good for man to be alone. He didn't say it's not good for man to be single. Difference. Welcome to Excellent Living with Cheryl Martin. I'm Doris McMillan. That was relationship coach, Dr. Johnny Parker, Cheryl's guest today. Once a month, Johnny joins us to give practical tips for building healthy, long-lasting relationships. He has 20 plus years of counseling experience. Johnny is also the author of the book, Renovating Your Marriage Room by Room. Cheryl wrote First Class Single, Rules for Dating and Waiting God's Way. Today, they're unpacking a hot topic for singles, but one important to discuss, God's Sexpectations. Here's Cheryl to get the dialogue started. A challenging and somewhat confusing subject for many singles, God's Sex expectations. Now, is that a new word? You came up with that word, Johnny. Is that a new word for Webster's Dictionary? Yeah. Sex expectation. <laughs> yeah, that's a word that I've kind of coined, Cheryl. God's sex expectations. And by the way, parents, if you have young children that are listening to this show, you may not want to have them listening to the show as we'll be dealing with, as Cheryl said, a steamy and hot topic about singles and their sex life and singles and sexuality from a biblical God honoring perspective. You say, Johnny, that there are five sexual myths and why singles need to destroy these myths. What's the first one? Well, one of the things, Cheryl, is we want to look at the idea of the culture created sex. That's number one. That's number one. Number two, we want to look at is sex is not to be enjoyed. And number three, we want to tackle the subject of sex is my greatest need. Fourthly, we want to look at if I were married, I would have unlimited sex, marathon sex. (laughs) Help me, Jesus. And the fifth one, marriage would put an end to my sexual struggles. And so we want to look at this, Cheryl, because as we take on this subject of God's expectations, we want to address what God intended for sex to be. Because he created sex. He created sex. He created sex. There is no such thing as safe sex. God never intended sex to be unsafe. And so we want to look at that idea, like number one, for example, that the culture created sex. There are many people, secular Christians, who are really believing and adopting the mindset that maybe Howard Stern came up with this idea. Maybe Dr. Ruth or Dr. Phil or Hollywood, sex in the city. Sex is satanic is another idea that people have in terms of the culture created sex. The devil wasn't bright enough to create such a good gift. James 1.17 says that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above. I love the words of Dr. Howard Hendricks, a distinguished seminary professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. He said this, we ought not be afraid to discuss what God was not afraid to create. And so... God is the author. God is the inventor. God created the game of love, not the devil, not the culture, not Howard Stern and the body of Christ. We ought not be afraid to discuss what God was not embarrassed or afraid to create. God created sex and sex is a good thing in the right context. As a matter of fact, I believe that Christians should be the first ones on the forefront to discuss openly sex as God intended. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I believe that as well, Cheryl. For example, I took my 12-year-old son away for a night, and we talked about this idea of God creating sex and that this is a good thing. It's amazing. In his school, Cheryl, the young girls are so aggressive. And he goes to Christian school. And one girl said to him, Johnny, are you a virgin? He had never heard that word before. He thought that was a bad thing. He's out there shooting basketball. A girl asks him, he's a virgin. He hollers, oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> and he goes up there trying to do a layup. I said, son, we need to talk. So we talked about this thing where I gave him the street terms and I gave him the dictionary terms in terms of his sexuality and his body. And we talked about what God intended and that this is a wonderful gift, a wonderful creation of God. But the context that God restricted sex was for Marriage. What's for marriage? The second sexual myth you talked about, or you mentioned, Johnny, is that sex is not to be enjoyed. 
explain that because I'm not so sure a lot of people focus on that myth that it's not to be enjoyed. Well, you know what? There have been some teaching even in the body of Christ over the years and even outside the body of Christ in the culture. Some women, especially I know in my counseling experience over the years, when women go from being single to being married, believing that sex was something to be endured. Especially, I've met a number of women from the South who were raised with that idea that sex was something to be endured, tolerated. It was all pleasurable for the man, but the woman was just to tolerate it and endure it. During the Elizabethan era in England, women were told to simply lie there and think of the queen. That, <laughs> that simply, you know, you get pregnant, you have a son, hopefully, and that son could serve in the queen's army. Well, I can tell you, no married man wants his wife to simply lie there and think of anyone but him. And so God intended for this thing to be enjoyable not just for procreation, but also for recreation. I believe the next myth, Johnny, number three, resonates with a lot of singles, and that is sex is my greatest need. (laughs) There are some who feel I can't live without sex, and even though I know what God's Word says, hey, I'm a man, I'm a woman, I have urges, I have needs, it's my greatest need. Yeah, and you got to ask yourself the question, why does God allow such pressure? One of the things that moved me, I was reading a book one time, Cheryl, on a plane, and I came across this statement that God is drawn to weakness, that God is attracted to weakness. That statement really moved me to think God is drawn to weakness. I can't think of a more greater weakness and challenge for singles and even for some marrieds. We'll talk about the marrieds in a later time, but I can't think of a greater challenge for singles with the whole idea of what do they do with their sexuality? Why does God allow such pressure? God created sex to be a metaphor of oneness and intimacy that he desires for us to have with him. There's a reason why in heaven we're not going to be given in marriage. I believe that when we're in heaven, we're going to experience the oneness and intimacy with God in the fullness. We're going to consummate this relationship. And so there's a word that gets used, and it's the word yada. And it's in Genesis 4, 1, where it says Adam knew Eve. Well, he's not talking about he knew the size of her dress, her dress size or what kind of shoes she liked. It was talking about he knew her deeply. He knew her completely and fully. Well, our greatest need, Cheryl, is for relationship and community. And I believe God allows the pressure in order for the pressure to drive us to community where women with women can be honest about their raging hormones, feeling sexually starved. And they can talk honestly about that. And the same for men, where men can talk honestly about what's going on in terms of their sexuality and talk about that and the battles and the temptations. Our greatest need is not sexual. Our greatest need, as God says, it's not good for man to be alone. He didn't say it's not good for man to be single. Difference. Aloneness is our greatest need. Our need for relationship, our need for community. James 5, 16, when we confess our struggles one to another and pray one for another, that's where the healing happens. There's something about a man or a woman getting honest about and being vulnerable with someone of the same sex about pressure. In this case, we're talking about sexual pressure. And when honesty happens that way, there is a power that gets released in that kind of vulnerability, that kind of honesty, Cheryl. Let me throw out this question that I believe some of the singles are thinking as they hear this broadcast. And some may say, well, it's easy for married people, especially (laughs) married people in the church, to say when it says it's not good for man to be alone, to be in relationship with others and to share your frustrations. When you're married and you have a sexual partner, your needs are being met, yet the church does not adequately deal with the sexual frustrations and desires and longings for singles and just because a person loves God, those desires don't go away. Absolutely. And I think that moves us into another lie, Cheryl, that marriage would put an end to my sexual struggles. That is a myth. That is a myth that once you're married, yeah, you're at green light, you do have a license, but I can tell you as a counselor, there are many married people who feel sexually starved. I hate to say it this way, but in some cases, you have more singles having sex than married people. Yeah, yeah. And what's going on in these situations, you have some married people who are denying each other, okay, which is against God's word. You have some singles in some cases who have bought into the idea that they'll postpone marriage and put marriage off. And I believe when Paul says things like, you know what, it is better to marry than to burn I think the norm in God's mind was for people to get married. I really believe that. I think that was the norm. And that the reason that you're seeing people get married later and later and postponing marriage is because they are fornicating, they are having sex, or they're having solo sex. They're experiencing masturbation. And so if a man or woman 
are experiencing the gift of sex without the commitment of marriage and covenant of marriage, well, why get married? And I believe Paul is saying it's better to marry than to burn. What he is saying is that you don't simply get married to have sex, but I believe it's a light blinking on the dashboard of your heart and soul that says, you know what? I don't have the gift. I need to be thinking about and praying about a life partner and moving in that direction. And so I think that's a critical, critical thing. But it also seems like what you're saying, especially with this myth that marriage will put an end to all sexual struggles, you are saying that whether a person is married or single, right. you need to have the proper view exactly. of sex and to put sex in the proper context right. and its purposes and right. how you approach it. Right. And that proper context would be what? The proper context is one, being marriage. Two, that even if you're married, you still have to have boundaries around your relationship. You have to have boundaries around your relationship. Like, for example, as a married man, I don't have meals alone with women. That's a very intimate thing for me to do that. And so I don't travel with someone of the opposite sex. I travel with my wife for the most part. And so there are boundaries. There still are battles that as a married man and temptations that don't go away, that don't go away, especially this time of year. It's summertime and, and, and weather's hot and people ain't, you know, dressing properly. So those things don't go away because you're married. You still have to put up boundaries. You still have to be honest about the temptations going on in your heart. And so those things will still be there even though you're married. And so, you know, that marriage does not put an end to this. There are still battles and boundaries that have to be set. And in summary, for the single, Mm -hmm. the proper view of dealing with the concept of sex being the greatest need Mm -hmm. should be what? In this stage of life should be what? From a God's perspective. That they want to honor God, that they want to honor God, that they're willing to be very honest. Again, God is attracted to weakness. I don't know of any greater weakness that a single person faces in terms of their sexuality. I've counseled many and have done seminars where they've asked questions, what do I do when I go to bed and I want to have sex? And I know that I can't. People have talked about taking their Bible to bed, holding their Bible, calling a friend of the same sex. And what is your thing. answer to them? That just what I've been saying in terms of being honest about their struggle and their weakness and being honest and sharing that with someone of the same sex sharing that intimately with Jesus. God doesn't go, oh my gosh, not like God doesn't know that that's what's going on inside of us. And I've had many singles who have said that in those times of intense pressure, that they have sensed God coming alongside of them in those moments, but it does force us to a vulnerability that many of us don't, you know, we don't want to be that vulnerable with someone and share that this is the weakness going on. He says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. One of the things that I say is that God never asks us to do something that he will not by his power enable us to do it. Mm -hmm. There is no temptation taking you, but as such as is common to man, he will with the temptation allow you a way to escape. Yeah. Yeah. Another myth that you mentioned, Johnny, and I believe this one is a fantasy that once married, sex is unlimited anytime, anywhere. <laughs> yeah, sure. That's a myth. That's the myth of unlimited sex, marathon sex. I think sometimes singles think when they get married or that married people just have sex all day. They don't go to work. I tell you, hey, listen, somebody's got to pay the bills. <laughs> They're 24 hours in a day. You know, what are you going to do with the other 23 hours and, and five minutes in a day that married folks don't sit around having sex all day? There's no norm in terms of how often you ought to have sex. And again, we'll talk about that when we talk to marriage about this subject. There's no norm once a day, once a week, twice a week. That's a myth. But the other myth is just we've been saying that this idea of unlimited sex that anytime, anywhere, that doesn't work necessarily in marriage singles, that it happens that way. I know married couples who have sex every night. They shared about that in their counseling. And other couples, it's once a week. Sex is really... It's a metaphor for intimacy, but it's also a, it's a food metaphor. Different people have different appetites in terms of how hungry they are sexually. And so you're right. That is a fantasy in terms of marriage and sex. We've talked about the five sexual myths. Next, we're going to take a look at God's purpose for sex since he created it. 
You are listening to Excellent Living with Cheryl Martin. To find out more about this weekly program and available resources, just log on to excellentliving.org. That's excellentliving.org. Cheryl's guest today is marriage and family counselor, Dr. Johnny Parker. Once a month, he and Cheryl discuss topics designed to strengthen and build healthy relationships that honor God. Johnny is the author of the book, Renovating Your Marriage Room by Room. Cheryl wrote, First Class Single, Rules for Dating and Waiting God's Way. Today, they're giving some candid tips to singles on God's sexpectations, since sex was his idea. Let's return to their discussion. Johnny, we just covered the five sexual myths. In our remaining time, let's talk about why God created sex. It was all his idea. Yeah, I see three purposes. One, procreation. Secondly, recreation. And thirdly, intimacy. Let's look at the procreation. In Psalm 126, verse 3, he says, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord, the fruit of his reward. And Malachi 2.15, he says, didn't God create you to become like one person with your wife? Why? So you would have children and then lead them to become God's children. That's pretty basic. Most of us as Christians, we understand that in terms of for procreation, for babies. I mean, and the idea was to have children, to evangelize your children, and so that there's a remnant that after mom and dad are off the scene, that there's children here who know Christ, who can be witnesses for Christ in their generation until Jesus comes. That's pretty basic. Most of us understand that. The second reason God created sex was for recreation. This is where I think we're getting better at this. Ten years ago, Cheryl, you know, you couldn't have gone in a Christian bookstore and find a book about ways to improve your sex life. We just didn't do it. And who was going to go buy the book and put it on the counter? Like, you know, you come in there with your glasses and, you know, you don't want nobody to see your face because you're embarrassed. Well, I think we've gotten better in realizing that the enemy is wrong about this. The enemy, I think, for years has put the Christian community and created the sense of shame with sex. That is dirty, it's bad, it's not to be enjoyed, it's being tolerated. God says in Proverbs 5, 18, 19, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. Let her breasts satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always with her love. This is in the word of God. Solomon didn't write this behind God's back. God could have told him, hey man, that's too deep. We don't need to go there. Let's leave that out. He went and wrote it and God applauded it. And God said, yeah, that needs to be in my word. People need to know that. And he gave us a whole book in the Song of Solomon and about two people about romantic love and lovemaking. I was just about to say that, to mention uh, the book Song of Solomon. And it's my understanding that Jewish boys really at a certain age, we're not even allowed to read that book because of its sexual content. Exactly. It would get them boys fired up. I have three sons, and I know that they won't be reading Song of Solomon, hopefully until their wedding night. Hopefully, if I can help it. But I think that because it is in the Bible, it's a validation. Exactly. Again, that sex within the proper context Mm -hmm. of which God designed it, and him being the manufacturer, the designer of sex, he says it's Good. Yeah, he says it's good. He says, you know, and there's a place in the Song of Solomon, Cheryl, in chapter 5, verse 1, where twice in that book, by the way, they make love. Everyone, all the listeners are like, where, where, where? <laughs> well, you go read the Word of God. That's one way to get y'all in the Word of God, is talk about sex is in the Word of God in the Song of Solomon. In chapter 5, verse 1, theologians, scholars believe they are making love and that the voice of God shows up and God says, imbibe deeply, O lovers. And it's like God saying, go for it. This pleases me. This honors me. I teach marriage, for example, that before you make love, ask God's blessing, because if sex is like a meal, you want to give God thanks for what you're about to receive. And so this was to be a picture. This was a metaphor of intimacy. And that's a big, big thing with God. Sex was to be a picture of intimacy, vulnerability between us and him and between a man and a woman in the context of marriage. Well, that gets you to the third reason that God designed sex for intimacy. How is that different from recreation? Well, and I'm not sure that that different, Cheryl. I think that what Genesis 2.25 gives us, that although the man and his wife were both naked, they were not ashamed that Adam knew Eve. We mentioned that word yada. It's a deep knowledge, that intimacy, that there's a pleasure with sex. 
but there's a deep knowledge where people begin to make discoveries. And, and of course, again, the pleasure that goes with that, but is a deep knowledge that's unique to those two people. The sad thing that today, when people begin to merge their bodies without merging their hearts and they merge their bodies, and they become one with this person, one with that person, one with this person, one with that person. Uh, something special gets lost in that because there's no covenant. There's no commitment. And, and so that hurts the heart of God. God wants us to enjoy intimacy in the deepest way possible. I wish I had had this teaching before I knew the Lord because I blew it in this area and made bad choices. And I'm so thankful for the grace of God. And I think it's important for singles to hear. And we'll deal with this in the next coming show about what happens if as a single you blew it in this area How can you regain your integrity? So we want to definitely give hope for singles, and we're going to provide that for them. But the intimacy is into me, see, I-N-T-O dash M-E dash S-E-E, into me, see. It's really being vulnerable with one another and sharing your hearts together. One thing I wanted to mention, Johnny, when we look at God's purposes for sex, and you mentioned procreation, recreation, and intimacy, his purposes were strictly relegated for a loving couple married. Yeah, yeah. That his purposes for sex were never for two people who had not made a covenant right. relationship. And yeah. one of the things that I share with singles, God loves us so much that he always offers us his best. He wanted us to have a lifetime mm to get to know each other, to be in a loving relationship where you didn't have to worry about this person walking away from you Mm. or having sex with you today, having sex with Sally tomorrow Mm. and Jane the next day. Mm -hmm. Also, or Bill, Bill, (laughs) but also being totally free and not concerned at all about AIDS, venereal and other sexual diseases, Mm -hmm. because if you're in a monogamous relationship, you don't have to worry about Mm -hmm. any of these diseases. That that was God's optimum when he Mm. said, Mm. sex is my gift, but it is only to be unwrapped Mm -hmm. when you say I do. Exactly, Cheryl. And again, singles, I know a lot of singles resent when a married person, yes, I'm married 15 years, and they resent having a married person talk to us. But I hope you can hear in Cheryl and my compassion that our hearts are not to condemn. Our hearts are to give a biblical perspective and to give singles hope and encouragement that the pressures are real. We're not minimizing them, but we really want to urge singles that God's ways still are supreme and God's ways work. And so we want to give you encouragement and hope. And that God's ways are always best. Our best. That when God denies us something, it is for our best. Mm -hmm. And I think about, and he says, if you're natural father only wants to give you good gifts. I love you more than your parents. And I've often thought about this, Johnny, you have three sons that when you say no to them, you're not playing games that if your son were to ask you, say, dad, I think it would be great to eat M&Ms all day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, from his perspective, it sounds great, Mm -hmm. but you as a loving father would never allow that because you know it would be to his detriment if his diet was M&Ms. Exactly. Exactly, Cheryl. And, you know, again, I can't say it enough, Cheryl. I just so firmly believe whatever God denies us is always out of love. Like the Ten Commandments, he tells us 10 times, I love you. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't commit adultery. Take a Sabbath. Don't steal. Don't lie. And I think the other thing, God, and I don't think we talk about this enough in the Christian community. God wants to drive us to each other in terms of community. He wants, and I think one of the things the enemy does, he wants to create discord so that women will say, I don't trust other women. I'd rather talk to men. Men will say, you know what? Brothers aren't real and, and brothers try to you know, compete with each other. And I think all of that, the enemy has used that. And God wants, in terms of this area, particularly in pressure, for us to be able to have same sex relationships where we can talk honestly and be vulnerable. The power of honest confession breaks the power of lust. Singles, please hear that. The power of confession breaks the power of lust. If you're in isolation, married or single, if you're an isolated man or woman and you are dealing with lust, you will lose in isolation. But it's honest confession. A man with a man, a woman with a woman will always break the power of lust. 
And God intended for this pressure to lead us to his heart, but to lead us to open, honest, intimate, vulnerable relationships with each other of the same sex. I really believe that, Cheryl. So we can experience God's best. We've covered a lot in today's program, going back to the basics, answering the why of sex and the myths. It's so important for us to know God's original purpose to counter the messages that we are getting in our culture. Some good insights, Johnny and Cheryl, on the sexual myth singles believe in God's expectations for singles. We have a resource available for you at no cost, a list of 26 questions you should ask when dating. If you'd like to get a free copy of the 26 questions singles should ask, you can write us or go to our website, excellentliving.org, and send us an email with your name and mailing address. Cheryl's guest today on Excellent Living, marriage and family counselor, Dr. Johnny Parker. You can learn more about Johnny and get information for ordering his book, Renovating Your Marriage Room by Room, by logging on to excellentliving.org. That's excellentliving.org and clicking on the links page. If you're enjoying Excellent Living, we sure would appreciate your support financially. This program is made possible by friends like you. You can become a partner by donating online when you visit the homepage at excellentliving.org. Or, if you'd like to pay by check or money order, you can send your gift to Excellent Living, Post Office Box 15285, Chevy Chase, Maryland, 20825. That's P.O. Box 15285, Chevy Chase, Maryland, 20825. Thanks so much. If you would like someone to pray for you during this season of your life, we have some dedicated counselors who enjoy going to God on your behalf. You can email your request to prayer at excellentliving.org. That's prayer at excellentliving.org. Or you can call our prayer line at 832-766-1695. That's 832-766-1695. Burdens are so much lighter when someone shares them with us, and prayer is the most effective way to get an answer from God. Tune in next time for Excellent Living. That's doing life God's way.